So um, you should take a look on Moodle, read the syllabus closely. You should just assume when you're when you start your college class that the onus is on you to read that syllabus carefully. If not, for the very reason that maybe you might take a class that you, you think has been advised to you or you think is a good idea to take, and then you read the syllabus, the syllabus, and you say, "Oh my goodness, no way! I can't handle this this semester. This is too much." So you should be in, like it's being like being an informed consumer. You know, read that syllabus and see what's expected of you. If, um, if you don't think that if your course load is like too much, for example, maybe you have a course like anatomy and physiology that's notorious, time-consuming course from undergrad that most psychology majors have to take. That might not be the semester to take two really intense courses. So by reading the syllabus, you know up front what's expected of you and whether or not it's a good idea for you to be in that class. The, the, the key is don't figure it out five weeks from now. <laughs> you can't get, you know, and it's a difficult thing to get out of it. In the first week or even like, you know, the first few days of class, you read that syllabus closely and you, if you're honest and you, with yourself and say, try this is an important topic for what we're going to discuss today in research. So kind of purging out and say your desire, what you want to be the case versus what is probably going to be for reality is a good thing to do, the foresight. So read that syllabus closely, be sure in all your classes, and be sure that uh, this is the time and for this, you know, for, for this. And that, that'll help you in the long run to make sure you be prepared. The question that um, is that you're going to have to submit by this first due date for assignment one is right here, assignment one. So it's unlocked, it's um, August 29th, so it's open. So if we, if we view it, View assignment one. It has been my experience that this is this is the the question. Let's see if I can ask you. Um, it's been my experience that first year psychology students often have an idea about what psychology is and what psychologists do that is quite different from the bigger picture of the field as described in our textbook and our lectures. Thanks. Uh, that, not mine. Um, please describe the three most salient aspects of the field of psychology that differs from your impression of the discipline before having read the first chapter and attending our lectures. Be sure to mention your assumption about the field and the description offered in the textbook or the lectures. And if you use information from my lecture, please be sure to reference that lecture in your paper as well. Now, I'm go we're going to go over APA referencing style, not at this second, but right now what I want you to a wise thing to do is just be aware of the question for the week that you're going to have to write your 500 words on your two-page double-space, you know, situation. And it's really not a, I mean, it's like, you know, you know, it's not a laborious thing. You're just thinking it should be, oh, I thought this. And it's actually not like that at all. And it, it's, it's fascinating because in our introductions last time, I heard some terms used. I heard some things said that I thought to myself, oh my, I wonder how disappointed this person's going to be when they hear that the view of what the field is might not be exactly what, the, that what you think it is. So be aware of these things. What you're looking for is, what is it, three things? Is that what we said? Yes. Three things that differ from what you thought psychology was. Remember I said last time, you're going to know a lot less about psychology at the end of the course than you do now. And the, the, the kind of joke about knowing is the, the distinction between knowing versus thinking. When one knows something, they know. They're certain. This is, we're based in, I know. And that sense of knowing, in my experience, is um, 
dangerous business. It, it turns into something called uh, intellectual hubris. <laughs> and what we want to do is the exact opposite. We want to have intellectual humility. What is intellectual humility? You know someone who knows, they, they walk around with all the stuff they know, and they, they make sure that you know how much they know. <laughs> and they walk around like it's some kind of commodity. There was a, one of my favorite psychologists, Eric Fromm, called it intellectual commodification. In other words, this is the person who does a lot of reading, has a lot of degrees, and they walk around, oh, well, guess what I know? They can't think to tell you the date. They can't think to tell you the fact, the truth, the end all, be all of everything. And, and what is psychology? We say this is driven by ego. Ego doesn't mean egotistical in Buddhist psychology. Ego is Latin for I. So when you are doing stuff to serve your need, the illusion of the self, look what I know, that's intellectual hubris, arrogance. But when you approach something with intellectual humility, you don't know you think. And what, we, what I would like to encourage you all to do is get away from knowing and get involved in thinking. And the most exhilarating aspect of this is, of thinking, is like when you're in the water, and if you go in this pool or the ocean or wherever you're swimming, you get into the water, you know? And do you know that feeling that happens? <laughs> Did my voice crack when I said this? Because I'm so intimately familiar with this feeling. When you get, say you go off the shoreline, you're swimming or whatever you do, you paddle out, and then you get to that point where sometimes, sometimes you go and there's this immediate drop off in the water. It's a little, oh my goodness, this is over my head already. And then you, you swim out a little farther, you paddle out a little farther, and then all of a sudden you can stand and the water's at your ankles. So there's a sandbar out there, right? And then you feel, oh, I'm, now I'm safe, now I'm at the sandbar, you know? And then you go off another 10, 15 feet and there's a big dramatic drop off. And maybe you treading water and you reach down, oh my goodness, I don't know where the floor is, I don't know where the, the bottom is. And that can be an extremely scary feeling. You don't know what's down there, you don't know how deep it is. There's mystery involved in this. You know, standing in the shallow water feels safe. It feels like you're in control. Think of that as no. You're out in the deep waters and you're treading to keep your head above water, you're working, it's not comfortable, it's not safe, but that's thinking, that's like thinking. And I think it's a very exhilarating feeling and it, it becomes addictive actually. It's like in, intellectual ex, in excitement, that switch from knowing to thinking. And this is what I meant when I said you're going to know less in 15 weeks, but hopefully you're going to be thinking get lost in the woods starting today. We're going to get lost in the woods together. What are those woods? Well, they're like the questions. And when you come out at the end of 15 weeks, you're not going to know any answer, any one definite answer to any of those questions. You're going to know the questions really well. You dig that? You're going to know the woods really well. We're going to be in the woods, and we're going to be like lost in these woods, and you're going to come out. And the things that you think you know certainly at this moment if I've done my job well enough, and if you've been willing and open to, be, to, to take part in what I'm proposing to you, you're going to probably have at least two, three, four really solid answers to every question you have. And the most amazing thing about this game, the thing that turns me on most about learning and thinking and being in this whole intellectual game of whatever it is we're doing, is, um, is the fact that things are really ambiguous. And um, that you, you'll come to a place where you'll, you'll settle in. You'll find the answers that are most convincing to you. But, you. but hopefully you'll retain that intellectual humility to realize that there, there are, in fact, answers, not an answer. And those, that, those answers, can find a better answer than others, or one that works better than the others, but to find the one that's true, the one that's right, 
I don't know if that's the area, I don't know if that's intellectual humility, and I don't really think that's science. That's um, other stuff. You know, this term dogma. Dogma is the teaching. You, I'm going to teach you today a, a dogma, the dogma of psychology. <laughs> Dogmatism is when you treat that dogma as the ultimate big T truth. So everything is dogma. Everything you learn is dogma. It's, 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 I, it's a, a system of thinking. But to realize that throughout history, that is coming, and throughout in science, that's under constant revision and it's constantly changing. So as they say in Buddhist psychology, try, don't, try not to get too attached <laughs> to your position. Um, remain open and flexible. And um, the reason I emphasize this is because you will encounter, it's very appealing, it's very seductive, and, I, I, and it happens all the time on radio interviews and podcasts and television and internet. You will find video after video about someone who's going to tell you the truth. They're going to tell you the facts. And based on their presentation style and your individual need, that need your, the need within you that you need to, to have fulfilled, who knows what it is. It usually comes from a, a desire. What it, desire usually comes from a lack within ourselves, a perceived lack within ourselves that we feel we have to, to, to satisfy, to compensate. So we're usually most attracted to answers or people who are delivering answers that speak to some insecurity in ourselves. This is very fascinating. I, I, I think that if you really want to get to know yourself that well, uh, be aware of what makes you defensive, what puts you on edge, what makes you want to fight, prove other people wrong, because that's the stuff to look into. <laughs> we don't fight stuff that we don't believe. We don't have to prove somebody wrong. We'll get into more of this in a throughout this lecture. So be aware. We're, we're, we're hoping to do this. We're turning the world upside down a little bit at this moment. I'm telling you, be careful of knowing and get turned on to thinking. Be careful of, of big T factual truths and get more into the idea of more convincing or less convincing arguments and explanations. And um, so what I'm going to give to you right now, well, these are the things that you should be thinking about these things and that question. Be aware of things that, oh, well, I thought psychology was this, and it turns out to be this. Quite possibly, you can take down a note if this is important to you, but maybe there's already one. Maybe um, you have heard from someone on growing up, some authority, that uh, science is about knowing the truth, the fact, the definite truth. And suddenly I'm telling you, well, no, science is constantly under revision. You come up with, uh, with basic ideas that have evidence or don't have evidence, and there can be a better or more useful explanation, and that's in constant revision. Things that were true 50 years ago are no longer true today. Things that are true right now, stuff that you are being told without a doubt are true, are most likely going to be laughed at in 50 years' time. Some of it. Some of it will hold for it. So do, do you dig what I'm saying here? Avoid the shallow water. You know that feeling when you're, you're on the shore and you feel your feet down there, and then sometimes this time of year is true, the water gets crystal clear here in New Jersey on the shore. Very crystal clear for various reasons. And you can see down, and that's reassuring too. Sometimes you, you go into that ocean, you know, and it's murky. There's a lot of, there's a storm at sea, or and there's stuff in the water, and you can't quite, you can only see down. And that's threatening too. It, it, the unknown, it's the unknown. What's down there? I can't see it. Then your imagination starts running wild, you know? Uh oh. <laughs> Um, again, get comfortable with the murkiness. Get comfortable with the uncertainty. Embrace it. And 
How do you get to a position, that moment of feeling, I know, I'm safe now, I'm on firm ground. That's the moment you should be most scared. <laughs> That's like you're walking through the forest, and you come into this deep forest that is all brush and weeds and everything's overgrown, and you're, you got your machete out, and you're cutting, and you're down on the ground, and you're you know, trying to find the way, and where's the path, and I'm lost. What a scary feeling when you're lost. And then you come into this little clearing, and the sun comes down through, this, through the trees. Mark Heidegger called this the lictone, the lictone, the clearing, the lighting area. And you say, ah, thank goodness, now I'm someplace safe. I can see everything. No snakes, <laughs> nothing like this, no murkiness. And that's the moment you can enjoy that for a few seconds, and then that's going to overgrow and you're going to find that the, the, the forest starts to overgrow again. And you're, you're, the more you read, the more you learn, the more lectures you have. Be aware of clinging to certainty. And the best thing you can do is become intellect, have intellectual humility, which means think, consider, and always be prepared to reject what, you, what you're sure of today, what feels good today. And also look inside yourself. This is, this is great for those of you who are interested, not which I think is almost everybody here, interested in therapy. Really want to know uh, about yourself? Start from looking at your, what needs you have that certain answers are fulfilling for you. Maybe your, those needs are so strong that you um, want to make sure everybody knows these answers. The answer, evangelize the answer. You know, go on and tell them this is what you should think. This is the answer. This is the answer. That finger point. And then ask yourself, wow, why? What's that about? It's the opportunity to learn about yourself. As a, again, one of my greatest experiences was undergoing a Dominion analysis. You'll learn exactly what that is to some degree in, within this class. But uh, one of the first things that um, my analyst said to me was, Matthew, whenever you feel defensiveness, experience it as a gift opportunity to learn about yourself because we never have an emotional reaction to something we're indifferent to. So that feeling that, oh, they got me wrong, I have to prove them right, imagine there's an example. Somebody in this class says, Joby, this is all nonsense. You're uneducated. Now imagine how I could react to that. Joby, you're uneducated. Well, uh, how dare you? I'm uneducated. Don't you know I have a PhD in all this business, and I graduated from this, and I studied with this, and I did this, and that, and all of a sudden, red flags everywhere. Now, if someone in here says to me, I'm uneducated, I'm going to be like, wow, I, 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 I don't, how can I take offense to that? It's so, I, I mean, I have so much college debt. Ha, <laughs> reminding me of my education. That would just be ludicrous for me. It would be like, wow, I wonder what's wrong with that person. Someone, did you dig what's saying, what's happening to you? Now, if someone looks at you and says, how dare you say I'm uneducated? Well, then maybe there's a red flag that you're hitting on something within me. Maybe there's something that I'm struggling with. You see, uneducated is much different than not so intelligent. <laughs> you, know, you, can be, you don't have to be real smart to be educated. It doesn't have to know how to do follow the syllabus and get to work in on time and, and have a lot of stamina to get through all those years of study. Self-discipline is the big thing. But that doesn't mean you're, you know, some great thinker or something. Now what if uh, what if someone says to you, Joe, you're not a, you're not as insightful as you think you are. You're a hack. You read some philosophy and you know some things that turn people on to these exciting ideas that, you know, it's, the students want to hear, and you're, you're tickling their, and then all of a sudden I say, oh, what if I get, that could make me defensive. Because maybe there's some truth in that. Maybe, uh, maybe I have heard the cliche so many times that I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm saying this again? <laughs> you're hearing it for the first time. I've been hearing this for 48 years, and 
and all this for a long time. So do you get what I'm saying here? The things that affect us the most, the things that make us want to really fight and make sure the other person gets it right, are the opportunities to look into yourself. And I think that is the most important aspect of research. I'm going to pause for a second and just see if, I, if anybody has anything they want to ask or say or anything. I'm going to barge you with it. We're breaking the rules of the words. <laughs> All right, so let's, now that you're thinking about these things, let's dig into something here. I'm going to turn this. Uh, what confidence? Raise the screen with great confidence now. Okay, so let's start now with this word. Now, um, you can. What I'll do at the end of class, if someone reminds me, I'll take a picture of the board and post it. Um, let's look at this word, first of all, psychology. Psychology. We're going to start at the very beginning. Do you know there's ways to, there's ways to um, define words? Are you ready to get onto the slippery slope? Here we go. So definitions of words are not stable. They change over time. If you want some evidence of this, I'll give you some funny evidence from when I was growing up. When I was growing up, there was a word bad. And there was a time when bad meant not so good. And then something happened. There was a song that came out where bad became good. Like if someone said, wow, that's bad, all of a sudden bad was good. <laughs> now, there was a time, you get the point, right? Words shift in meaning. So when you look at the definition of a word, always look at the contextual, the context in which that word exists. Let's take, for example, psychology. What is your book? Does anyone remember what the book says the definition of psychology is? Anyone know? The book says that the definition of psychology is the scientific study of behavior and the mind. Now, that definition is the one presented in the textbook that I have chosen for us to use. Another textbook could have a different definition. Another textbook author, there are different definitions of psychology. The most common one that I've heard was the scientific study of behavioral and mental processes. And you're going to understand the difference between mind and mental processes. That one word change means so much. So we have definitions, the definition of psychology, as we're going to find in next week when I give you an introduction to the history of psychology. Uh, that word psychology has changed quite a bit in the past, well, since the 19th century, in the past 200 years. Uh, and the, there's reasons for this. So what I want to look at is a word that you might be familiar with, etymology. Do you know this term, etymology? No. There's uh, something called an et etymological dictionary. An etymological dictionary gives you the roots of words. Uh, often those roots go back to Greek origins, or uh, German, or Old English, or Latin. And if we look at the etymology, it gives you the history of the word. And we look at the term in its original sense. If we look at the word psychology in its earliest sense, the earliest definition that we, literal translation we can get, it comes down to two Greek words. The Greek words are suke, that's how it's pronounced in Greek, in ancient Greek. We're talking about the, the Greek of Socrates, Homer, like ancient Greek, not modern Greek. But psyche is how you see this, psyche. That's how you would say it today in Greek Suke. And logos, psyche and logos. Now, 
Now, when you get, I'm going to give you the user-friendly version of this explanation, but what this literally means is the word psyche, you, there's a, a Greek myth of psyche and eros. Myth doesn't mean lie, it means story. So when you, sometimes you'll hear about, I'll use the term mythology, and not mean that it's a lie or an untruth, it's just a story. And we can use stories to tell truths, little t's. <laughs> Convincing stories to make sense of things. That's what's done largely in uh, various religions. You, hear, you learn a story that helps you to make sense of things. And uh, the ancient Greek myths uh, were once religious beliefs, and they're stories that help us to make sense of things. So we have the story of psyche. The literal translation of this in ancient Greek is originally butterfly. Butterfly, breath of life, and here's the big one, soul. Soul. Now that today is a loaded word because history is loaded with a lot of religious connotations. But in ancient Greece, the original term psyche is, you can think of this Try to let go of religious conceptions of this and think of this as the an anima. This is uh, actually the, the Romanized version of the anima, animation, the animating force of life. That's the psyche. The term psyche as we use it today, like if I ask you guys, what does psyche mean? What, what's it, what do you think? If before, <laughs> before hearing the lecture, I would think. If, if someone just on the street said, hey, what's psyche? What would you say? Uh, I'm no, the, not, the, not the right answer. Oh, no. Just the, the normal answer that anybody on the street, yeah. I would just say mental or something. You got it. The mind. Yeah, the psyche is the mind. Actually, that term mind, psyche is the mind, didn't come into existence until the, the 18th century, the 1600s, 1700s, the scientific revolution. We'll, we'll get into that more, but in the 1600s, the word psyche started to take on significance as mind. Up until that point, psyche was really something that meant the animating force of life, the soul. But not necessarily soul in the religious context. You'll, you'll hear me say this again, but if you look back uh, to you know, 400, by 400 BCE in ancient Greece, if you, if you take uh, Plato's dialogues, you read the Republic of Plato, uh, the laws of Plato, you hear over and over again, Plato's talking about the soul. It's in the original Greek, ancient Greek, it's psyche. Now, if you, I just gave you a valuable piece of information. You can now go read Plato, and you'll be realizing, oh, this is a psychology textbook. Because instead of thinking soul when Plato's writing about the soul, I think he's talking about the psyche, the, what we this is the animating force of life, you know, of, of human life. And then suddenly you have a psychology textbook. And this is why, if you know, there's little things, little tricks, that if you know the key to, to something, all of a sudden you can read Plato and you get it. Where other people are struggling with it because it, they're, they're, they're imposing a modern view on something that was not intended at that time. So why does the translator use soul and not mind? Because the translator of that text is doing a literal translation. And literally, psyche is soul in ancient Greek. And then in the scientific revolution, let me hold off on why this changed, but I'm going to explain that to you next week. Why in the 1600s it shifted from soul to mind. For right now, just remember the earliest definition of psychology is Soul and logos. Now, what is logos? Uh, I. Pathos uh, <laughs> and logos. Uh. Facts. What's that? What is it? Uh, what happened? Uh, I can't hear you. It's saying, it's saying, okay. eat those. Uh, I missed that. Logic, right? This is comes from lo the logos. This uh, means logic. Uh, yeah, lo logos. What I don't. You guys ever see logos? What's a logo? It's not. I honestly didn't see it until I see logos see all over the place in this room. Oh, like. Here's a logo. What's this logo? <laughs> 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 
<laughs> you know that logo? McDonald's. Yeah. Oh, that's a logo, right? How about this logo? Hey, I have something to tell you. You know, this these logos, they can get serious. These logos are nothing to play with. Do you know that in Haiti, the little kids get all this gar this uh, these T-shirts that we send to the Goodwill shop. They send them down to Haiti or some other place, Haiti typically, and they get the T-shirts, and they're all our Tommy Hilfinger and Nike T-shirts that that we got tired of looking at because they were last year's, and so now you know, <laughs> and then the kids go down and they get handed this stuff, and if you go down, you'll see. Some of the some of the people wearing the T-shirts with the logo song, with the T-shirt turned inside out, so you can't see the logo. Why? Because they want the shirt, but they don't want what the shirt represents. You dig what I'm talking about? Now I hope that now you get a new appreciation by me giving you this taste of digging deep <laughs> of what logos really is. It's a symbolic representation. So. Make it simple, bio and biology is logos is it's the study of. And that's true, the study of. That's how it's used contemporarily. But more than just the study of, let's really dig in and say it's the symbolic representation. And what is the symbolic representation? The site, the logos of the psyche? Well, it's writing, writing, words. In English, in this case, or ancient Greek, however you want to look at it. You know, this is a symbolic, you can't drink the word water. You, you, you dig this. So in other words, you have the word water, and I can logos represent it in English with this. And I can say the word water acoustically. But this is not something that's going to quench your thirst. If you're thirsty. And the sound of it isn't going to do it either. The only thing we can actually come into contact with and really experience water is by doing what? Pouring it on us, smelling it, tasting it, putting it in a box. This is an important thing to think about when we're in. Don't confuse the symbolic representation for the phenomenon. Uh, I'm going to unpack that in a little bit. This is, I'll pause here and see. So now you have two definitions, psyche logos. We can simply say it's the symbolic representation of the soul, or we can say it's the study of the soul. And we know that's the original, oldest, etymological, etymological definition of psychology. Or we can say there's another definition of psychology, the one that's in your textbook and the one that psychologists use now, which is the scientific study of Behavior and the mind. So now, all of a sudden, you have in, you have like you, there's something there. Um, you, someone said, "Hey, what's psychology? What's the definition of psychology?" I said, "Well, first, it's going to depend which textbook you're using today. But today, basically, it's the scientific study of behavior and the mind. However, in its original etymology, you can get these etymological." I got an app on my phone, etymology app. When I was a kid, I, you know, I, I always liked it. This stuff was a turn on to me. Like, you know, whatever it is that you have fun doing, this was my kind of fun. I like, I would, I would carry it in my car, my best friend and I. My best friend and I ended up being, he's a sociologist, <laughs> so, uh, which is interesting. I'll talk about difference, differences and likenesses with psychology and sociology. But uh, we used to carry around in our cars these big, thick, heavy etymology dictionaries, pre-phone, pre-phone app stuff, you know. And we'd be driving down the road and say, well, I wonder what the etymology of that word is. And you can, this is a great way to start research papers. You start, I'll give you an example, speculation. Do you know the etymology of the word, what does it mean to speculate? You need to think about something, right? If you invest in the stock market and you read books on investing, the thing you want to stop doing is speculate. They all say this, no speculation. Don't try to predict what's going to happen. Speculate. You just you have to stick to facts. So this word speculate means like to think about, to consider. 
I'm going to speculate on whether they're this movie is interesting or not interesting. I'm going to speculate on that person's behavior. Now listen to this. If I tell you the, the root of the word speculate from Latin, the etymology is a word, and some of you are going to chuckle, and the guys are going to want, why are they chuckling? It's a speculum. Now do you know what a speculum is? A speculum is, in ancient Greece, a mirror. In its ancient term, speculum is mirror. So think about what this intends, the philosophy built into this word. When we speculate on something, when you go to a movie and you give your opinion of that movie, remember last time when you talk about whether that professor is good or bad? <laughs> that is really talking a lot about what? The reflection of yourself you see in that thing. If you go to the movie and you like the movie, chances are you are seeing something in that movie that you'd like to be true about yourself. That's the speculum. That's the speculation. Something that we're defensive about. We don't want to see it. No, I want to fight it. Get it away. See, this is all kind of winding back into the psychology. So when we speculate, when we understand that etymology is where it gives us a certain insight into the origins of, of, how, of thinking, not knowing, you know, and suddenly we don't know the word so well, we have to think about the word. So etymology is always a fun way. So, quick question. Something that you might want to write on, an idea. What's the difference? What, how many definitions did we learn in this class so far of psychology? Simple, two, right? An ancient one, the literal etymology of the word, and a modern one. How many definitions of, look, will psychology always be defined in the same way? As we'll see in lecture next week, no. Very definition has changed multiple times over the past 150, 200 years. So, that's it. What, what, uh, you know, when you go to school in Europe, there's a little, you know how here, like I went to school in the United States, like you, you all did, I would assume, um, in high school, I mean, you know, before college. And in, in American schools, usually what you get is the teacher asks a question and you raise your hand and give your opinion on something, right? And uh, then uh, in the French schools, they do something different. In the youngest, in the youngest years, they do, the, the children learn, the French are obsessed with philosophy. This is the name that card. Uh, and they, the still school children are taught to answer questions in what's come to be known as the French dissertation style. In most European schools, from middle school to high school, and if you go to college or graduate school in Europe, you have to, this is how you do it. When, there's three stages. When the teacher asks a question, the student actually stands up and first gives a broad overview of the, a, a little history of the question. Well, this the teacher says, what's the definition of psychology? The student raises their hand and they stand up and they say, well, in, According to the reading, according to the lecture, the, the definition has changed multiple times over history. The earliest form of the word is the, you know, the study of the soul, and, and the most recent is the um, scientific study of behavior in the mind. And then the next stage, so that's number one. Real brief, just gives a brief overview. It's kind of like proving that you have the right to answer the question. It's not just your opinion, you've actually done your homework, you know? And then the second part is, oh, you choose one definition and go into more detail about it. The scientific study of the mind, as we learned in class, really embraces that since the modern period, the 1600s, the scientific revolution, it embraces the idea that, that psychology is a scientific endeavor, and it uses the principles of the scientific research methods to study how one acts observable empirical behavior and what uh, and the processes of the mind, what's happening unseen within the individual's psychological world. And then finally the third you get to give your opinion. I find that you know, psychology looking at behavior and mental processes is very convincing, but the idea that it can't be done in 
any other way other than science is not so convincing. You see, I got, I earned the right to give my opinion. Now imagine this. People, I often wonder what it would be like if we started doing it with the French did and started teaching little kids to answer questions like that <laughs> from the early stage. Oh my goodness, we'd be walking around out here and everybody would be a genius. You know, because you couldn't just give your opinion, you'd have to know what you're talking about, prove that you did your homework before you gave your opinion, you know? But what else is very cool about this? I just outlined for you how to write a paper. Okay. That's the dissertation style. So these little kids are learning from the earliest age how to structure a paper. Give a broad overview, give something specific, give your, give your assessment of the facts. That's how to write a good paper, at least how I would talk about writing a paper. Can you put the example on Moodle one of these days? Um, sure. Yes, just so I can remember this. Um, sure, I'll, I can do that. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Etymology. We should look up the etymology of etymology. Do you, do you have an internet connection? Look up etymology dictionary and then put in etymology and tell me what it says, please. I never looked up the etymology of etymology. Etymology simply means the origins of words. Bad shifts meanings. Can I just write that down? Go ahead, do whatever you like. It means the origins. The origins of words. Yeah. Uh, I, that's a kind of clumsy answer I'm giving you, but you know, you, if it's fun, then you, I'm telling you all your classes. Whatever your topic is, look just out of curiosity what the etymology is. And start with the etymology of the word, and your, your professors are going to be like, ooh, okay, something's going on here. But like, why is the, uh, like the etymology important? Well, the, that's a great question, actually. The etymology is important because it gives you um, a sensitivity to, the, to, to being open to how the original sense of this word can take on, can, can shed fresh light on a more habitual use of the word, a more present use of the word. I mean, think about this. You're going to see this word psyche. We're getting lost in the woods. And you're going to see that word psych in psychology. And where before you may have always only thought that, and this just opened up all kind of worlds of possibilities. Um, so I think it's getting off the sandbar. That's kind of fun, too. Uh, <laughs> for me, I, I don't know. What is etymology and etymology? Um, facts of the origin and the development of the word. Yeah. And it also gives us the, the real sense of things shift. Don't get too comfortable. You know, I know the answer. It kind of brings home that, you know. I know the definition of the word. It's always contextual. I'm going to show you an image. It might be a good time to juice this up. In the Moodle, you can see I uploaded a few images. Now's a good time to show you. This image um, right here. Not that one, not that one, this one. Look at this. Now, it's a, I don't know, if, are you able to see with this lighting situation? Oh, um, what do you think of this, these images here? What's, what, if you look at this, these two shades, this shade here, you all know this, this illusion. What's the joke about this? That there's no uh, two colors, right? That's right. It's the same color. That center, you can see it a little better with the lights down. Um, these are ident this is identical color. This is the identical shade of color. Think about this. Have you ever been nervous when you go to meet different people? Excuse me. And you say, oh my goodness, who's the true me? What's the real self, the real me? And you go and you meet one person and you're hanging out. Maybe you're hanging out at the laser tag and you're presenting yourself in some way. And maybe it's like this. 
And then you're at the Margaritaville something, and you're like this. Like, who's the real you? Like, who are you really? Like, do you, you know, like, could you imagine if I go home and I start lecturing to my loved one? <laughs> I do it. <laughs> She's gracious about it. But anyway, so, you, you know, here's the interesting thing. If you're real concerned about who the real you is, well, guess what? It's a lot of different things. <laughs> it's largely dependent on the context. This is context. Maybe this is school, and this is out with your friends or in the dorm or something. You know, here's a, here's a lot of graduate possibilities. Maybe this is you on the sports team. Maybe, you know, that this is me in the classroom, and this is me out in the ocean. This is me walking down the path and looking over and seeing the, the girls on the longboards today skating. And I'm thinking, oh man, I'd like to be doing that too. But they probably look at me and think I'm like some guy who dresses like this when I go home. And, you know what I mean? Like, uh, like we change. Like, I'm all these things. It's the same color. The things that appear different about me and you and everybody in here is our relation to the environment we're in. This image, to me, has been the fundamentally most interesting aspect in, from day one of studying psychology for me. I'm so fascinated by this. The idea of the stable me, the illusion that there's some definite me that exists independent of everything else, and the wisdom that's accompanied that. Look at the thought-provoking stuff in these, these images. How context defines, remember something when you get whatever it is you do in life, you get reviewed or somebody dumps you or someone says yes to go out with you, whatever this is, and also you say, oh, if someone compliments you, compliments are very dangerous things if you get addicted to them. They're as devastating as, potentially devastating as criticisms, nasty criticisms. Not, good, not friendly criticism, constructive criticism, but negative criticism. The reason for this is, if you start to think, oh, somebody said this nice thing about me, I must be okay. And then when someone says something not so nice to you, you take that equally as serious, then suddenly you're devastated. You know? So you have to kind of remember, it takes context. There is no attractive, unattractive. There's no good, bad. There's no right, wrong. There is, you have those things within a context. You have those things within a context, but that's, that's the psychological game. That's, <laughs> that's pretty cool. And then all of a sudden, oh, you realize when somebody comes up to you say, oh, something so positive about you, and then you feel so good, and then, oh, talk about this is great for media psychology going after, I'm going to post this and see how many thumbs up I get, and facing some kind of achievement on that. Remember this. And remember the consequences when you open yourself up to that, because that means there's a dark side, you know? It, it, what, one of the things that I've always enjoyed is uh, freeing yourself from the good opinion of others. Do you know, I read an article today. I, usually, I forgot to, to share this with you when we walked in. There's an article that was in the paper where did I put it? Uh, the Harvard, Harvard has this thing called the Longevity Study. It's the longest running, check this out, it's the longest running study of, the longest running study, it's called a longitudinal study, so they're doing psychological research. It's the longest running study of aging. It's going, it's now the people that they're studying are now in their 85th year. And the guy who's overseeing, like, this study has been going on for so long that the people at Harvard Longevity Study, the people who shepherd the study, the, the person who's in charge of conducting the study, they've gone through, a, I don't know how many, but they've gone through a number of people who, because you can't live that long and now you have to retire at some point, you know? So, there, you could have, it's handed off to the next person. And the most current person doing this is Robert Waldinger. And it just so happens that Robert Waldinger is not only a, 
professor of psychiatry and psychology who also happens to be a Buddhist priest, which is very interesting, especially because one of my interests is in Buddhist psychology. But what Wallinger says, he found these two things that tie into this thing we're talking about. So we're looking at a longitudinal study that's the same people over a long period of time. That's different than a cross-sectional study, which would be uh, a group of, you can look at right now, you can do a lot, you can do a study in one month if you look at, you know, 40, 10 year olds, 40, 20 year olds, 40, 30 year olds, 40, 40 year olds, 40, 80 year olds, 40, 90 year olds, you can do, you can compress that, but that has some problems, as we'll come to understand, that when you study the same people over the extended period of time, there's, there's variables that you, you get rid of. It's a more accurate study longitudinal. It's also more difficult to do, more expensive to do. People drop out of the study, people die, people disappear, <laughs> you know, so it has its own complication. But here's the two pieces of great information. You ready for this? Robert Wallinger finds um, the number one regret of, 80, of people now in their 80th year of life. These are, I'm not saying that everybody in their 80s is wise. I don't believe that. However, I think there's a lot of wisdom. So in something like, what's the number one regret? in their 80s. Who has a guess? What do you think the number one regret is for someone in their 80s? Uh, that, this guy's fast. Anybody have a little slower hand, slower draw? He's going to win. <laughs> well, uh, hold on one second. I'm interested. Let's hear. I want to give someone. What do you think? What do you think that, what do you think 80-year-olds, the, the most commonly spoken regret people in their 80s, from their life. I'm guessing they're not. The thing they look back on. All right, go ahead. Uh, not attempting things. Like not, like not trying new things? Yeah. Interesting. Not even not trying new things. Think, I think that's a good idea. It's no, not the one. It's not the one. What, what, what do you think? Maybe like wasting time or procrastinating time? That's not it. That's a good one, I think. I like that. Living deliberately. I think it's is all tied into the big one. And the other guess? Can I guess again? Yes. They regret regretting things. <laughs> that's great. I love it. No. <laughs> but that's good. Regret, regret. Maybe it is. I'm going to give it to you. The number one regret that they have is too much concern of what other people Is too much concern with other people think. Not worrying so much about what others think. Thought. Which I think a lot of your answers tie into that, actually. So you're kind of right, but this was in the words of this researcher. That's number one regret. Do you know what they say is, this is fascinating to me. The number one, they find the most important factor in contentedness. I'm very careful not to use the word happy. I'll explain later. But contentedness. Content. Content is everything. There's nothing good. There's nothing bad. Everything's okay. That's different than happy. Happy is an artificial. You're happy when you see someone you haven't seen in a long time that you love. You're happy when something unexpectedly fortuitous happens. That's happiness. But to kind of expect that you're going to live in that state all the time is not Regardless of what they try to sell you on the television or the internet, that's not practical. And if you want a sure fire way of being depressed, try that. Try to always be happy. So if you see someone who says, I just want to be happy, maybe that's your problem. You're going to, you're going to fail. Try contentedness. Okay, so now I give my little sermon. What is the number one factor that these folks in their 80s they find not what they self-report, but what they look at and what were the circumstances in correlating in relationship to their level of contentedness. So in other words, the ones who showed the most contentedness through a number of, of means of studying contentedness. There's ways to do it. You can do a survey. You can do observation. You can 
ask the person in an interview a clinical interview. There's different ways of assessing one's contentedness. What's the number one thing they find that contributes to, to contentedness in life? People. This is brilliant. How many agree with it? People. People meaning being in a group of something bigger than yourself. Exactly. Something bigger than yourself. That's the number one thing. It's not money. Let me tell you some interesting things about money at some point. <laughs> money doesn't do it. A certain amount of money will make things much easier. But if you think it's like this, the more you get, the more happy you are, uh-uh. It doesn't work that way as the researchers. So here's the two things from the Harvard Longevity Study that, are, that he talks about in his article, which I'll put a link to it on Moodle if you want to read the whole thing. It's fascinating. Is not worrying what other people think, less concerned with the opinion of others, and not being so self-focused on me, I, look what I am, look what I know, look what I achieve, but a, a bigger awareness of something larger than yourself, a social network, I don't want to use that term social network in a contemporary way, a social, being part of a social group, um, making the difference between collectivist and individualistic cultures. In an individualistic culture, you know, one of the famous studies they show that an image of, of fish swimming. There's a whole school of fish, and there's one fish that's outside of the group. And if they show this to individualistic culture, people who grew up in individualistic cultures like the United States or the UK, most European countries, the people say, what's happening in this thing? I used to run this study at Rutgers in Newark. I'd have 100 students in the classroom. I said, anybody who is from somewhere else, who grew up in South America, or in the Caribbean, or in China, or India, or well, all these different collectivist cultures, as they're called, I said, please leave the classroom. And they get a little nervous. What the hell's going on here? <laughs> and I said, just be patient. They leave the classroom. And then I was left with all students who were, grew up in this culture. I said, what's going on in this photograph? And they look, they say, oh, look at that. There's a leader fish, and then the group is following the leader. I said, remember this answer. I called the students back in, and I asked them to look at the same image. I said, what's happening in this picture? And you know what they said? Oh, there's a fish that's lost from the group, and the group is going to try to help them to join the group again. Think about that. Talk about reality and the difference between where we grow up and the context of what we live and how we view. And there was a researcher who did a study of Joan Miller, and she found, interestingly enough, in the Japanese school, listen to this one, <laughs> this is a great study. So there's this thing that we're going to study in depth called attribution theory. And attribution theory is how we attribute things good or bad. <laughs> who knows what that means? Right. But things that we experience as positive or negative, and how we make sense of those things. So, in classic, Heid, uh, Fritz Heider was the guy who came up with this and wrote a great book on attribution theory. What he found was this this is back in the 1950s. He found that if something, when something good happens to us, get an A on your test, he you said, oh, Aren't I smart? <laughs> I'm such a hard worker. We take credit. Something personal about us led to that success. The person next to us, we see they got an A. Oh, well, they, they uh, must be a favorite of the teacher. They, must have, uh, they mustn't have to work as much as I have to work. They mustn't have kids like I have. You see this? It's self-preservation. When good things happen to us, we tend to take credit for it. And you get an F on the test or bad things, you say, oh, well, the teacher, the, the professor stinks. He didn't talk about anything that was on the exam. <laughs> the textbook is horrible. Uh, all types of things, again, it's self-preservation. We all tend to do this. This isn't like, you know, you have to work to, to become aware of this. And that's being more honest with yourself. You have to be aware of the tendency to self-preserve, you know? And the funny thing is, when they looked into this in, that's individualistic cultures. 
when they went to collectivist cultures, such as Japan, check this out. They found that in the Japanese classroom, when a student does well on the exam, they thank the teacher. Thank you, teacher, for teaching us so well. When someone does poorly on the exam in the collectivist culture, they found that they found when someone did poorly on the collectivist culture, the researchers found that the other students go to that, that student and say, How we failed you. How can we help you? How can we help you to this would be the difference between in you know, an individualistic culture, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. In other words, the more you want something, the louder you get, the more that's what we're talking about culture. And in the collectivist culture, which you might find if you're in class with students that grew up in, in, in say China or Japan, you'll find a more willing, a more desire to kind of fit in and be a part of the group and not stand out. The, the idea is that the poppy, the flower that rises above the rest gets cut. Now, there are many different attitudes towards this, and I would guess that growing up in an individualistic culture, we probably might have a bias towards one. But there's some interesting things to consider, uh, problems that individualistic cultures have that are non existent in collectivist cultures, Scandinavian cultures, things like this. To think that the individualistic culture is the way to go because it's the one we know best and one we're with is again that's the that's dogmatic <laughs> not that's taking the dogma as well this is the way to go you know fight for it maybe so um, this is the importance of context any questions or thoughts about that stuff all right let me turn that off and put this up Here's a big one. You're not studying psychiatry. Psychiatry is something different. <laughs> That's you go to medical school to be a psychiatrist. This is psychology. Let's open these windows. I think the light is next to it. Yeah. So when you, when you Talk about what you're studying and what you want to do. If you're a psychology major, realize that psychology follows something called the biopsychosocial model. The bio, biological, psycho, psychological, social, context, society model of um, study. Psychiatry is what you study in medical school. And in medical school, you study something called the medical model. The medical model is, the answer is, of course, psychiatrists largely do not do talk therapy. Psychiatrists view all diagnoses uh, as a collection of symptoms that were treated either by medicine, in other words, the underlying factor is a chemical or a neurological problem or a hormonal problem. So there's medication, so some of the famous SSRIs, anti-anxiety, anti-mood, antidepressant, like uh, Prozac or Lexapro, Zoloft, and SSRI, we learned about those in a couple of weeks. Um, and, or there's some sort of surgery that needs to happen in the brain, an implant of some sort that propagates different hormonal or chemical levels. So in the medical model, all things that we talk about of um, psychological disorders, mental illness, anything of this nature, is a medical condition that's treated through medical measures, with medication or surgery. Psychology is not based on the medical model. It's based on the biopsychosocial model. And the main difference between psychiatrists and psychologists in this clinical setting is that a psychologist is not only interested in what the biological causes are, potentially, but what are the social causes and what are the psychological implications, the personal's individual experience that are contributing to whatever they are experiencing that we might call abnormal behavior or mental 
and all this. Do you, do you take what this is the difference? So if you if you are convinced that this is a medical condition that you, that interests you, and you, then you probably do want to could potentially if you want to work in a clinical setting, you could potentially want to be pursuing psychiatry, but that's not psychology. Today, like when you see, do you remember the TV show Frasier? That show? Did you ever see the TV show Frasier? Frasier was a show about a fictional talk therapist on the radio. He was a psychiatrist. You will find psychiatrists today who also have degrees in talk therapy, but talk therapy is not part of medical school psychiatric training. So if you're using that term psychiatry, you realize that the letters that come after the name psychiatrist are usually MD doctor of medicine, whereas in psychology, you would have a PhD, an EDD, so maybe that's a doctor of education. So. so that is something that stood out to me the other day when we were introducing, I heard the word psychiatry. So make sure you're using that as you intend to, you know, if, it, if that's what you're But they help each other though, right? Psychiatrists and psychologists typically are working together. Uh, in so, uh, psychiatrists, of course, would be taking a, a medical model approach, so they'd be prescribing medications, and they would, uh, for example, when I worked in clinical work in mental health clinic, um, I worked in community mental health, which was um, the majority of the people there were uh, on public assistance or court order for therapy. They were in prison or had a court did something that got them into legal issues and the judge ordered them to come for anger stuff or whatever, uh, you know, who knows what. And uh, in the clinic I worked at, there was a psychiatrist who would see them to treat them for medication. And they were also required, if they were going to be seen by the psychiatrist, to have weekly one-on-one -on -one therapy with the therapist. So you're kind of like attacking it at both ends. Here's something to just throw out here for you. For the psych so you can be a two types of psychologists here. You can be a clinical counseling psychologist. You go to a party, someone says, oh, hi, nice to meet you. Uh, what do you do? <laughs> what, what do you do? I don't like asking people what they do. I like asking people what they do for fun. <laughs> it's like a little, what do you like to do for fun? Sometimes when you ask people what they do, I think the, the other question is, how much money do you make? Am I smarter? Where do I measure up with you? When you ask them what they do for fun, try it out. It's very, it's a different, you get a different reaction. So what do you enjoy doing? You see how you can get to know someone. So what do you, what do you, what do you do for fun? So it's, a, it's an interesting question. Well, if you're at a party and this person says, oh, I'm a psychologist, what does that even mean? Well, when someone, when I'm out and I meet someone new, and they tell me they're a psychologist, the next question I'm going to ask is, what kind of psychologist are you? You see, what most of you described in this class is, is a big part of psychology for sure, but it's only one part of psychology, the clinical counseling aspect of psychology. This is the helping profession. These are people who are working with other people to manifest change in someone's life. You do that? There's another type of psychologist called a research psychologist. A research psychologist does not work with people on helping them manifest change in their life. What they do is some sort of either academic research or work in a private institution where they are doing what's known as pure science. They're, they're gathering information on something that is within the, the con, con, um, within the frame of the discipline of psychology. So research psychologists, so for example, if you're at a research institution, you, a research university, that's where research is done. And the professors have labs. And you may have a visual perception lab, 
or you can have a child development lab. You know, you can have a perception lab, cognitive perception lab. You can have a lab on attachment theory. This is how, incidentally, it turns out that how we interact with our moms in the first six years of life comes to predict how we, <laughs> how we interact with our adult lovers. <laughs> Hold on a second. <laughs> no, it's it based in, in Freudian analysis, but uh, there's, there was a the name that you'll get with it is Mary Ainsworth. So she did this thing called attachment theory. And Bowlby, James Bowlby, they were a psychoanalyst, they applied scientific methods to their research. So you're on to something here. So research psychologists do research, and they're usually working within either academic institution, a research university, or a private industry research. Does that make sense to everyone? So we have two different types of researchers, or two different types of psychologists. There's actually, so you can have a clinical psychologist who teaches in a university, and you can have a research psychologist who teaches in a university. Now imagine this, if you're in a a research university where there are all types of psychologists hired, not just clinical psychologists, but also research psychologists. Imagine how different your introduction to psychology class is going to be, whether it's taught by this person or that person. There are two different interests. One is typically a people person. The other is typically someone who likes to be in a laboratory or a library or thinking and writing and thinking about setting up research, etc. Any questions about this? I'm going to add something to this. There's a type of psychologist called a teaching psychologist. And the reason I'm bringing this up is I consider myself to be a teaching psychologist. Um, although I've done research and I've trained in clinical psychology, I don't do clinical psychology. That's not what I do to make my living or pursue my interests in it. And I don't. Quite honestly, I'm more into searching than researching. <laughs> so if you dig what I'm talking about, um, I learned how to research. I've done research. I'll tell you about that in a little bit. But um, I wouldn't call myself a research psychologist. What I consider myself to be is a teaching psychologist. And what is a teaching psychologist? Someone who teaches psychology in colleges. I don't have a research lab. I think about things, and I like to write about those things and put them in books and publish them, but um, I, I would say I'm a teaching psychologist. I wouldn't. So you might want to add to this teaching psychologist. But the two classic things that you describe is either research or clinical counseling. So now here's the big question for you all. You come, I come up to you now. Remember, I told you you're going to know a lot. You're going to know a lot less about psychology at the end of the course than you did yes last Monday. So now I ask you the question: Where do you see yourself, even just in this very beginning of me kind of explaining this discipline? Where do you see yourself falling? Do you see yourself as maybe being a research psychologist that does act research in a, in a university and teaches maybe in a university? Do you see yourself as a clinical psychologist who works with severe psychopathology? We're talking things like schizophrenia and uh, disorders that are very significant, serious, severe depressa, depression, bipolar disorder, things of this nature. Or do you see yourself as a counseling psychologist who maybe works in the college counseling center, works with couples who are trying to get through trouble? Maybe works with students to become better students. Works with athletes. See, athletes and musicians that, although they could be needing clinical help, they're usually coming for counseling help. You're trying to get them. They're, it's not uh, about a mental health issue per se. Does that make sense? Do you see? Are you getting a little bit more nuance of where you could feel how you would describe yourself? This might be good stuff for your paper. When I before taking the class, I thought this is what I. Was. Now I'm realizing, oh, this is what I'm interested in. Or are you like me? You study, you get turned on to things, but the way you, what you have to offer others is teaching. 
I told you last time, I did about three years in clinical work. My, my uh, specialty was adolescence from the ages of about 13 to 24. And uh, I came to find out that the things that I was hoping to achieve in, in clinical work, I actually was able to do in teaching in college classrooms. I was actually more interested in helping people to manifest change that was less about mental health and more about achieving potential and stuff like that, you know? Helping students to learn how to learn. <laughs> I, that's where I felt, I felt most comfortable. So, a niche I found so far in my life is psychology. So I'll see if I'll, I'll be quiet see if you have any, anything, what's going on in your minds? regret? <laughs> oh man, what did I get myself into? <laughs> I have a question about teaching psychology. So in teaching psychology, I also fall under as like a teaching of a, like a DBT program, doing like teaching other people how to use skills and stuff like that? Sure, I think that you can teach clinical, so dialectical behavioral therapy. That this would be, that's what DBT, which is referred to, which incidentally is a contemporary form of Buddhist psychology. That's very fascinating. It's the principles of what I call Buddhist psychology, Eastern philosophy, but they uh, adapt this for a more contemporary cognitive behavioral language. I just throw out a lot of words that probably sound like sour too, but you'll get it in a second. So I think that would be part of, uh, that would be like you could be teaching. So you can teach how to be a therapist. Yeah. Would be, would be teaching therapy in a college or a university. If your primary thing is teaching other people how to do the thing, then you'd probably be a teaching psychology. But you'd be teaching clinical, or teaching counseling, or teaching how to do research. It's a good question. That answered it? Cool. Good. Now you know? No. No. <laughs> so Maybe, <laughs> who knows? Yeah. I think it's a safe, I think I'm giving you safe information. <laughs> that, that thing caused you any harm to say, yeah, that's crazy. But again, you could find a different argument. Argument not meaning let's fight. Argument meaning I, gave, I present to you my argument of how I'm organizing this discipline. It's not the only way to organize the discipline. You might have another professor that gives you something that resonates more with you. And, uh, so that's why I say always, you know, remain open. <laughs> remain open to losing everything you think is true here. Yeah. Any, any other? I've been down to some questions. Sure. Um, I'm supposed to ask my first question. Um, I wanted to know, do you have to take a statistics class or Yes, it's what we uh, statistics. There's an appendix in your textbook, and we're going to be doing some statistics in here, but that's not what this course is about. But statistics is a massive part of psychology. Do I use statistics? No. Do I know how to use statistics? 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 <laughs> yes! I went through years of graduate school in statistics. However, the kind of psychology that I do is not about statistics. However, very important. If you're gonna, if you're not gonna do it, you better know why you're not doing it. <laughs> Especially if you're swimming against the, the currents. Uh, you know. So if you have to know, yes, will you? It will take years of statistics, mathematics, um, analyzing mathematics, and we're gonna we're gonna get into this. However, that's a great great question. Do you see this image? I have. I have another image up. Does anyone recognize the image of? Uh, of this? What's this? I'm not going to close the lights. I'll put another, another little image up on the Moodle for you to think about. Anybody know what this is? Who recognizes as it fades? Yes! The little prince. How many of you have read The Little Prince? Do you have? Anyone else read The Little Prince? Do you know what this is? Salt. Exploré, hopefully. Saint <laughs> Exploré is the last name of the author. 
Um, and in the beginning of The Little Prince, it's a great story. The Little Prince shows this image to people, adults. Or, and the question is, what do you see here? And all the adults, all the people who have know, all the people who know with the big K, with the big T truth, the big F facts, they know. They're standing on the sandbar. Yeah, solid ground. I know. They walk around with their heads up in the air. They all say, oh, I see a hat. <laughs> you know, that kind of looks like a hat. The people who, they study the real stuff, statistics. They have numbers to back up their, their claims. That's what they see. But what does the little prince see? Look, I say, this isn't a drawing of a hat. This is a drawing of a boa constrictor with an elephant inside. And he should, this parable, this story is great. I recommend everybody reads this book. I give it, when I have little kids, I say, teach music lessons. And I try to make the kids more than musicians. I try to make them little intellectual terrorists. So I, so I give them a copy for Christmas or birthday of the little prince. Because I think it's so important. The little prince says that as much as you learn this, the more statistics you study, the more you know, don't forget to think like the child. Don't forget. You dig what I'm talking about here? Don't forget to remain. Don't get locked into knowing. Get into thinking. And thinking means daydreaming. Thinking means thinking like a child. Picasso said famously, I tell you, my entire life I've studied to try to remember how to draw like a child. <laughs> and if you can know the statistics, if you can know the research methods, if you can know the facts about your discipline, but yet retain this, that's why I think The Little Prince is a great story to, 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 to remember. That's from The Little Prince. Yeah. Boy, isn't that something? Oh, we're done. Time flies when you're talking. Do you know this is, a, we'll save this for next time, phenomenological time versus chronological time. Phenomenological, that's so maybe you're sitting there and you're, uh, four hours. The, the chrono says, oh, we 40 minutes. Your experience, your phenomenology, is, it was like five years, and now you get to go do something else. And then when you're me and you're up here and you're having a good time and you're, you're doing talking for like 10 minutes. It's a phenomenological experience versus the measure, the, the statistical experience versus the experience experience. Okay, any questions, Stop. I'm going to have an office hour now in the cafeteria. I like cafeterias, so I'm looking forward to seeing what would be good there to eat. So if anyone wants to have a conversation about this stuff, there, I'm trying to avoid getting food on my white trousers, <laughs> which is probably likely to happen. Have a good weekend, everyone. Be careful with uh, your be careful with your endeavors.